Howdy everybody, and welcome back. Um, now we're moving on to our next module, which has to deal with the wind and why the wind blows. Now, everything we've talked about at this point is very important, but I'd argue that wind is very fundamental. And the reason why it's so fundamental is because without wind, things wouldn't be moving from one location to another. And so a lot of the things about stable air, unstable air, um, moisture, and so on, wouldn't be as crucial if there was no wind moving those things around in the atmosphere. Now, why do we have wind? Well, to understand why we have wind, we need to understand a very important property of our atmosphere, which is air pressure. So, what is air pressure? Well, air pressure comes from one often unappreciated but very important fact, which is that air actually has weight and our bodies are acclimated to this but right now you are sitting in a room filled with air that's made up of trillions and trillions of molecules and each one of these molecules has a certain mass when you add all of them up these molecules exert a certain amount of weight now how much weight do they exert well on average at sea level the average weight is about 14.7 pounds per square inch. So if you were to take your thumb and your index finger, make a circle out of them, um, kind of like you would if you were giving somebody like an OK kind of symbol, um, that's about a square inch in diameter. So it gives you kind of a good idea, or about a square inch in area. And in that small area, there's 14.7 pounds of atmosphere from the surface of the Earth all the way to the top of the atmosphere. That's a lot of air, but thankfully our bodies are acclimated to it. Now, that's not the unit that we usually use, though. While pounds per square inch is a good way of visualizing and kind of getting the concept that air has weight, meteorologists don't use it. And the reason why meteorologists don't use it is because a lot of the equations that we use in forecasting the weather need a different unit. They use a unit called millibars. And this is actually the metric unit that is used in making weather forecasts and in studying the atmosphere. Now, you're not going to have to convert between one unit and another in this class. But what I do want you to know is that the average sea level pressure, the standard that meteorologists use at sea level is 1,013.25 millibars. So if you're at sea level, on average, the air pressure is 1,013.25 millibars. Now, with that said, as you rise up in the atmosphere, you have more air below you and less air above you. As a result, as you rise up in the atmosphere, air pressure decreases with height. Now, you've all probably experienced this to some extent. If you've ever driven up Highway 17 or Highway 9 or gone up Highway 130 or Interstate 80 up towards Tahoe or up any mountain road. If you've driven up the mountains before, you'll notice as you're gaining elevation that your ears might pop. And the reason why your ears pop is because pressure outside of your body is decreasing. And this happens because there's simply less air above you. Since there's less air above you, there's less weight. Less weight means lower pressure. And so as you rise in the atmosphere, air pressure decreases with height. Now, it doesn't decrease in a linear form, though. It doesn't decrease a certain amount per thousand feet like temperature does with a parcel of air. Actually, air pressure decreases exponentially. Now, what that means is that as you rise up in the atmosphere, not only is there less air above you, but the density of the air is decreasing. Think of it like a triangle, kind of like this pyramid here, 
with all of these cheerleaders. Here at the bottom of the pyramid, this can be the bottom of the atmosphere, you have three cheerleaders. In the middle of the atmosphere, you have two. At the top, you only have one. Well, the same thing happens in the atmosphere. Near the surface of the Earth, there's a lot of air that's crowding together. This represents high density. However, as you rise in the atmosphere, less and less air molecules occupy the same space. And the reason why this is is because of gravity. Gravity causes the Earth to attract most of the air molecules to near the surface. However, there's a few that stay suspended, and as a result, you get a lot of air near the surface, not as much air aloft. As a result, not only does air pressure decrease as you rise in the atmosphere, it decreases exponentially. What that means is near the surface, you have a lot of air. As you rise up even a slight height, the amount of air decreases rapidly. And then eventually, it levels off. But again, you have a lot of air taking up a small space near the surface, not as much air taking up that same space higher up. What I really want you to get from this is that most of the air in the atmosphere hangs out near the surface. As a result, air pressure decreases exponentially with height. Now, that's important to talk about, but for the most part, that's the only time in this lecture that we're going to talk about air pressure and height. As meteorologists, we're not as concerned with that. Instead, we're more concerned about how air pressure changes horizontally. Rather than looking at how it changes from elevation to elevation, we're more concerned about how it changes from location to location. Now, these changes in pressure on the surface of the Earth are very important because they represent weather makers. And in fact, much of the interesting weather we get in the atmosphere is caused by these differences in pressure. So we care about these. Here's why this happens. If you have an area of high pressure, that means that the air above that area is really heavy. When something is really heavy, it weighs down on you. Think about what would happen if you carried a backpack with all of your textbooks in it, not just from this quarter, but from your previous quarter, and your previous quarter, and your previous quarter, and so on. If you carried all those textbooks in one backpack, it would weigh you down. That's like high pressure. High pressure weighs things down. So air can't rise in that kind of environment. As a result, the weather is usually very calm and very sunny in those areas. On the other hand, in areas of low pressure, there's not a lot of weight. As a result, it's easier for air to rise. In areas of low pressure, we get this rising air, which then results in expansion, cooling, and condensation, which gives us clouds and rain. So we get a lot of interesting weather in low pressure systems. So as meteorologists, we really care about how weather changes, how pressure changes from one location to another. Now, what causes these changes in air pressure? Well, the main cause, the initial cause, is changes in temperature. And in order to understand that, we have to construct something called the two-column model of air pressure. Now, we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. But for now, since we care so much about how air pressure changes from location to location, we want to know how to measure it. Now, how do we measure air pressure? Well, air pressure is measured using a tool called a barometer. Now, the first barometer was invented about 400 years ago by a gentleman named Evangelista Torricelli. Evangelista Torricelli was a disciple, a, um, 
a, um, a minion, not like the little guys, but a minion of Galileo. And I'm sure you all know who Galileo is. Um, very important in astronomy, um, very important in science in general. Well, a student that he mentored went on to invent a barometer. Now, here's how this barometer worked. This barometer worked using the concept that air has weight. And so what Torricelli did was he created a little pool of liquid mercury. Now, we don't do this now because mercury is toxic, but back then they didn't know that. And what he did was in the center of this pool, he placed in a long, empty tube. And when I say empty, I mean completely empty. This is what's called a vacuum. In a vacuum, there is no air molecules whatsoever. It's an open, empty space. And what actually happens is, as air on the outside weighs down on this pool of mercury, it actually forces mercury into and up this vacuum tube. The higher the pressure, the more this mercury is being pushed down, and the more it's being pushed into and up the tube. The lower the pressure, the less this is being pushed down, the less that it rises in the tube. So that's how a barometer works. Now, this isn't the only tool that we can use to measure, t or to measure air pressure. Um, we've developed new tools and new barometers now, which thankfully, because we now know that mercury is toxic, but this was the original concept. A pool of mercury, air weighed down on it, pushed mercury down, and then up into the tube. Now, that whole pounds per square inch, that's actually not the unit that Americans commonly use when we talk about air pressure. The unit that we commonly use is what's called inches of mercury. So we're interested in how high up this tube is the mercury being pushed. Well, the average sea level pressure pushes mercury up 29.92 inches in this tube. And so that's our average sea level pressure, 29.92 inches of mercury. Now, with that said, we're gonna stick with millibars. But again, the way that air pressure can be measured using something like this pool of mercury with a tube in the middle. Now, we care about measuring air pressure because we want to know where are there areas of high pressure and where are there areas of low pressure. We care about this again because high pressure usually means calm weather, low pressure usually means stormy weather. Now, with that said, one of the complications in measuring air pressure is that Earth's surface isn't flat. Instead, Earth's surface is made up of many mountains, many hills, valleys, basins, and so on. And as a result, we don't have a flat area that we can say, okay, well, elevation's the same everywhere, so pressure should be sea level pressure everywhere. As a result, if we were to look at a map of air pressure across the United States, what we would see is low pressure over high elevations, high pressure over low elevations. These pressure variances would not be due to any kind of atmospheric anomalies, any kind of temperature differences, the presence of a storm or something like that. Instead, these would just be due to differences in elevation. So this makes weather maps kind of complicated. Well, meteorologists have a trick up their sleeve. They know how to take a pressure at a certain elevation and calibrate it to sea level. 
They know how to calibrate it to sea level. If they didn't do that, every weather map would look like big areas of low pressure over mountain peaks and big area of high pressure near the ground. So instead, we take all of these air pressure readings at different heights and we calibrate them using a known equation called the hypsometric equation and we calibrate them to sea level. The reason why we do this again, as I just mentioned, is if we didn't Areas of high pressure and low pressure would be determined by differences in elevation, not due to actual weather systems. So what we do, we essentially flatten the earth. We flatten the earth and then we figure out what the pressures are. We call these pressures sea level pressures. So. We take the pressure recorded at a given location and we calibrate it to sea level. Now, once we've done that, we can then create a weather map. And air pressure is plotted on a weather map through a set of what are called isobars. Isobars are lines of constant pressure. Now you're gonna be looking at these in a little bit more in detail in this week's activity. But here's what you need to know. Isobars represent an area that divides out areas of higher pressure on one end and areas of lower pressure on another end. So they're like a border in a sense. So for example, on this map, this isobar represents 108 mil or sorry, 1008 millibars. Sorry about that. 1008 millibars. Everything on this end up here is higher than the 1,008 millibars. Meanwhile, everything down here is lower than 1,008 millibars. And then you see this area where we have troughs and ridges and the pattern might change again. But again, this divides out areas of lower pressure on one side, so over here, areas of high pressure on the other side. Now these isobars are really useful because they help us identify areas of high pressure and low pressure. We look at these bullseyes and if as you're approaching the center of a bullseye these isobar values are increasing that means you're approaching a center of high pressure. On the other hand if as you're approaching the center the isobar values are decreasing, that means you're approaching a center of low pressure. So high pressure if you're going up in value as you approach the center, low pressure if you're going down in value. Um, one other thing I should mention about isobars is in order to simplify the map, we only plot isobars for every four millibars. So we don't plot one for a thousand, thousand and one, 1,002, 1,003, that would make the map a lot harder to read. So instead, we just go 1,000, 1,004, 1,008, 1,012, 1,016, and so on. So we go every fourth millibar. <sighs> now, that's at the surface of the Earth. In the next lecture, we're going to also be talking about pressure aloft. Now pressure aloft is a little bit different. Rather than caring about what the air pressure is at a certain elevation, what we do instead is we rise up into the atmosphere until we're at a certain pressure level. So instead of looking at, okay, what's the pressure at 5,000 meters? Instead what we do is we go up until we're at, say, 500 millibars. And then whatever height we're at, that's the value we care about. And the reason why we do this is because areas where we have very high heights for that 500 millibar level represent warm air masses. Areas where we have low heights represent cold air masses. We're gonna talk more about that in the next lecture. But again, rather than looking at certain elevations, we look at certain pressure levels.
And we're going to talk more about this when we get into um, forecasting in a few weeks. Height lines represent the height above sea level. So here's what this means. This map that I have here is what's called a 500 millibar map. What this means is everywhere on this map, the air pressure is 500 millibars. These lines represent at what height in the atmosphere is the pressure 500 millibars. These areas down here, the 500 millibar level is higher in the atmosphere. It's above 5820 meters. Meanwhile, in these areas over here, it's lower in the atmosphere. This area, the height is only 5340 meters. And again, we'll talk more about what this means in the next, in the next lecture. So this map is a 500 millibar map. Now, with that said, areas of low heights represent what are called troughs. In these troughs, we have very cold air. On the other hand, areas where we have really high 500 millibar heights represent ridges. Those represent very warm air. And in fact, usually when we experience some kind of heat wave, it's because we're under a ridge. That 500 millibar height is higher than it normally is. So when the air is very warm, that 500 millibar height is higher than it would otherwise be. This line here represents the average. This line right here. The 500 millibar height would be higher in warm air. On the other hand, if the air is cold outside, the 500 millibar height would be lower than it would otherwise be. Now, <clears throat> these two things, looking at where the 500 millibar height is high and where the 500 millibar height is low, gives us what are called troughs and ridges. Ridges occur where it's high, therefore the air is very warm. Troughs occur where it's low, therefore the air is very cold. But we'll talk more about that in a few weeks. <clears throat> the next lecture we're going to talk about what's called the two column model. But before we do, just a quick review. First, air pressure is the weight of the atmosphere above you. The average air pressure at sea level is 1,013.25 millibars. As you rise in the atmosphere, air pressure decreases with height. Now, we measure air pressure using what's called a barometer, and we plot air pressure on a map using what are called isobars. Higher up in the atmosphere, we instead of looking at a constant elevation, we look at a constant pressure level. So where in the atmosphere is the pressure 500 millibars? Where is it 400 millibars? And then those lines that we saw represent contour lines. They tell us how high that elevation is. So next time we're going to talk about this two column model. And until then, I'm Terrence Mullins. Thank you for watching.